Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, it's uh, Cambridge Lawyers Without Borders' great honour to introduce Professor, Professor Connor Geraghty to talk about liberty and security. Uh, Professor Geraghty has done his PhD at Cambridge and was a fellow uh, at Emmanuel College before going off to become a professor at LSE, but is also a founding member of Matrix Chambers. We're very lucky to have him here tonight talking about uh, this particular subject, not only because it's very much a continuing and contemporary dilemma in the law, uh, but because he's been writing on it prolifically since the 1990s, and it's the title of his upcoming book as well, so something very much, hopefully, at the forefront of his mind. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Garrity. Thank you very much. I feel it might be more appropriate for me to do a sort of voice-over, and then you can all look at this <laughs> rather spookily large picture. Uh, so, and it's over here to my right as well, which is slightly disconcerting, so... Uh, I'll try and avoid myself. Uh, I'm going to speak, I think, unless I run out of ideas, till about a quarter to two. And I'm looking forward to uh, questions, if you have any, or comments. And I'll tell you why, because this is uh, quite seriously a kind of work in progress in that I have to write this book for Polity Press and their Cambridge Press. And they go in for short books and they publish them uh, in a way that is quite sort of attractive and they go all around the world. This is some kind of series called Pathways of the 21st Century or something. So I'm trying to write for uh, a non-lawyer and an international market. And it's really quite tricky. And the book is called Liberty and Security. And it's about 40,000 words. So how do, you capture, uh, how do you capture what you think to be the essence of this in such a short space in a way that is appealing to a readership that is not a legal readership so much, or necessarily, and also an international readership. So that's what I'm sort of caught up in. And I gave you guys a number of options. There was sort of rabble-rousing, or there was sort of trying to remember what I said in the last book, or there was this. And uh, I was slightly anxious when you went for this, because, of course, it's less easy for me than rabble-rousing uh, and trying to remember what I wrote in the last book. So here we go. I'm going to read bits of it, which are slightly, for me, complicated, and then I'm going to wing it a little bit, and that will mean I can keep an eye on the time, and I can look forward to critical questions. I have to say there's another thing that occurs to me too, which is uh, this whole business of writing books during, uh, in an age of the internet and in an age of blogging and in an age of Twitter is really kind of preoccupying me a little bit because, uh, you know, with a fair wind, and this book delivered in May... It'll be out in 2013, you know, and it seems so odd now. And also, the it is a package of stuff that I'm not supposed to let anybody see until they go into a shop and buy it. And uh, I'd like your opinion on how, as <coughs> academics who obviously want to be able to prove that they are scholars uh, as a part of their job to get the money, but who academics who, apart from needing to do that, want to influence events, how they should do it, you know. Because I, I had a choice this morning. I was asked to do a, a thing for the Guardian Unlimited, I think they're called, on the Court of Appeal judgment in the uh, St. Paul's Occupy uh, case on Wednesday. I spoke at, in the tent uh, on Monday night, which is great fun. The university, they have a, a university, a tent university. I saw Trevor there, actually, didn't I? Was it you, Trevor, or was it somebody else? <laughs> Sabbatical leaves can turn people very odd. So, no, you weren't there. Very good, very good. And uh, I chose to work on this paper rather than do that. And it's quite an interesting... You, you, as a practical matter, when you have spare only a limited amount of time, what do you choose to do? It's quite an interesting point. You could endlessly blog and not do the work that you're supposed to do, but if you do only the work that you're supposed to do and nobody reads it, you do nothing. Anyway, it's a thought. It's a thought. So comment both on substance, if you will, and also I'd be interested in modes of expression. Modes of expression. So here goes. Uh, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about the meaning of these two words, and I'll read from the start of the book, and then I'll talk about the remit of the book or my ambition for it, and then I'll, I'll talk about the, uh, the, 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 how it works as a structure. So here we go. There are few words more dangerously confusing in their meaning than liberty and security. The first has a range which takes it across a spectrum, from the essence of human freedom at one end to a far narrower statement about the need for unrestrained movement at the other. 
Liberty is sometimes thought of as concerned with the individual, qua individual, and on other occasions with the individual within society. At one moment, the word seems to be about the need to be left alone by all authority, while at the next, it positively suggests active participation in the government of the day. No one seems quite sure whether liberty is, in any of its incarnations, the same as civil liberties. And even if it is, there are, as Jeremy Waldron pointed out, uh, at least four separate meanings to this term, civil liberties. Uh, as for the lawyers, in pre-rights days, they got into the habit of thinking of civil liberties as primarily concerned with the law and the control of police powers. And this is the space that the subject still occupies in, in legal practice, by the way. That liberty, security, has a similar range and equivalent level of vagueness. Used in conjunction with liberty, security has been historically taken to refer to national security, to the protection from external and perhaps even internal threats of particular lands which are organised as states. The field of counterterrorism has grown out of this orientation of security towards protection from attack. Uh, taking a different approach, we now see also the idea of security being reconfigured for the global age as something called human security. An idea of protection that focuses on people, not places, and which tries to get beyond immediate attacks on freedom to systemic failures in the public sphere that render us all, in a much broader sense, less secure. So lurking in the background is the idea of security as a guarantor of well-being captured in the contemporary term social security, which is now so familiar to us that we have forgotten the startling idealism and ambition that once oozed through those two words, social security. <coughs> now, paradoxically, in a way I will explore, this uncertainty over meaning, the meaning of liberty and security, does not detract from their power as positive signifiers. The first, liberty, suggests freedom, an unconstrained self, a life lived to the full, flourishing limit. The second secures the space for such a life, hedging it against the threats that might destroy it, seeing off the intrusions that threaten to make this success impossible. In this way, as a signifier, security communicates a kind of something like a platform for liberty, a launching pad and a safe landing place for the soaring self. These words echo across European languages and carry this implication. So there is a kind of oddity about words that you can show have various meanings which are difficult to one pick and yet words which carry positive connotations, which seem unaffected by this range of meanings. They're not rendered redundant by the variety of meaning that can be accorded to them. So I was thinking about that, and uh, the book will be about what these words mean, the shape that they have taken through time and from place to place, how much they have been realised, and for me, this is the key thing, and for how many people? How can we have these doubts over meaning and at the same time have such agreement on their positive connotations? How can words surrounded by such bonhomie be thought to be confusing? Well, I think what matters about liberty and security and what I'm going to concentrate on in my book and what I think begins to answer that paradoxical point is the question of the reach of the benefits that each so powerfully evo evokes being the central question. It is the for how many issue that will concern me. It's these questions. To whom are liberty and security to be extended? Is it to be to all or just the few? If it is to be to all, is it through community, state, regional, or international action? If it's guaranteed for all, 
How practical in their reach will these theoretical commitments prove themselves to be? Or to put this in a cruder way, for all the fine talk, what will really be going on on the ground today? The central arguments, I say, over liberty and security, to which these qualifications about meaning are to some extent peripheral, have always been about this issue of remit, reach, rather. To ask if liberty is constituted by freedom from external constraint rather than freedom to access the necessities for a good life is immediately to raise the question of whose freedom we have in mind. Our answer will reveal whether we are thinking of those already in a position to live a decent life and to want to protect it, or those for whom presently it is a faraway dream. Equally, when we talk of personal security, or national security, or human security, or, as I indicated earlier, even social security, it's immediately clear that our differences with each other will be mainly about who is to enjoy these valuable protections, not what it means to be safeguarded in this way. So here's what my argument is going to be in these 40,000 words. This book will set out to track the breadth of these terms through time, tracing the fluctuating range of beneficiaries that are to be found within their remit. It argues for a particular approach, one that regards the benefits of liberty and security as being rightly available to all and thereby capable of reaching, being required to reach, the many rather than the few. So viewing liberty and security in this all-inclusive way is going to shape my approach to the past work these words have done and the present meaning that I say should be accorded to them. This is not as easy as it looks. It's certainly a pathway of the type that I indicated right at the start I need, but it's not as easy as it looks. Neither term has been routinely understood in such broad terms. Indeed, as we shall see, the primary understanding of liberty and security in the pre-democratic era was always narrowly selective as to who was to benefit from the opportunities afforded the one and the safety delivered the other. So that was a kind of pre-democratic reading of liberty and security. And it was only when the radically egalitarian idea of community self-government took hold on a national scale that liberty and security found themselves open to being wrenched out of their elitist corrals and offered to all. Democracy gave the universalist readings of liberty and security an entry point and strong support. But it could not by itself deliver effortless supremacy. So I have the pre-democratic and then I have the democratic. But the democratic period has certain defects which I explore, which I'll indicate. Now. This is because the democratic victory, the republican victory, was in itself incomplete. A freedom for all that was invariably not forged afresh, but rather tentatively grafted onto pre-existing society, a society that had been designed for the few. Old elite readings of liberty and security persisted into the democratic era, jostling for space with their egalitarian interlopers. And now, as we drift towards a post-democratic model of government, or what I might call neo-democratic, a third generation, if you want, of ways of looking at the world, we see a polity that increasingly wears democratic clothes as a disguise rather than a proud necessity. We see these old pre-democratic meanings of the terms returning into popular use, underpinning and explaining readings of liberty and security which are ostentatiously universal, but falsely so. Words that hide inequality and unfairness by seeming to reach all when in fact, in their practical impact, they are tailored to the few. 
So here's, I'll put it another way, because I wasn't sure that would be understood in the book, and you have to draw all these people in, so here goes my thesis. My thesis is that we need to recover and re-energise true universalism in the way we use these terms liberty and security. Here are two words that grew to prominence at a time when the work they did was at the service of the few, but which, under the energetic influence of the democratic impulse, became goals towards which it was right for government to work on behalf of all. Now that this expansionist trend has been halted by a drift away from democratic fundamentals and back towards elite readings of liberty and security, albeit these versions remain cloaked in apparently universalist language, an echo of past, more egalitarian times, now that all that's happened, the contention here is that we need to grab back and restore these democratic readings. The version of liberty and security for which I argue, the universalist version, has three great allies, products, two of them of the democratic phase. I'll go through them. But these allies are, in a way, somewhat weak for reasons that I'll explain. These three great allies have had a beneficial impact on the reading of liberty and security as universal. The first is, as I've already indicated, this impulse for democratic government. The second is the notion of the rule of law. And the third is respect for human rights. Now, the push for democratic government, I would I regard as the main driver behind the insistence that the privileges of the few should be made available to the many. The second, the rule of law, predates the democratic turn, but complements it, maintaining that everyone must be subject to the same laws, and, just as critically, that the maker of any given law should not at any one and the same time be its authoritative interpreter. The third, the human rights movement, is of more recent origin, uh, at least insofar as we understand that idea today, uh, the very way that it describes itself reveals a commitment to an egalitarian vision of the world, one in which we should all have a right to the freedoms that were once thought the privilege of the few. And human rights today reach beyond the protection of liberty to encompass rich readings of human security, the sort that democratic government once made popular. So these three big ideas, democracy, the rule of law, and human rights, are universalist in their structure. They push societies that commit to them towards equality, or in the language of this book, liberty and security for all. In this neo-democratic phase into which I argue we have drifted, they present a problem, a challenge to the version of truth that seeks to assert a new elite common sense. Because this victory is not yet complete, neo-democracy has had to accommodate these contrarian pushes for universal freedom within its model, but without losing the drive back to privilege, which is its primary motor, the reason it has managed to impose itself in the first place. So we have seen not just the wearing of democratic disguises for authoritarianism, but also attempts to bypass the rule of law and to distort the meaning of human rights so radically that the term turns into a legitimate, uh, sorry, a legal legitimator of oppression rather than the passport to freedom that it ought to be. This neo-democratic turn, the world in which I argue we live increasingly today, wants us to regard democracy, the rule of law and human rights as outmoded, old hat ideas, incapable of coping with the challenges of the modern global world, the rise of extremism, climate change, the movement of capital, population growth, refugees, etc. Its proponents, conscious and unconscious, are happy to see these phrases contaminated by misuse, forsaken by those who should love them as creatures of illusion and hypocrisy. Liberty and security, that is, liberty and security for all, and not just the already empowered few, depends on recovering their finest meanings and using them as offensive weapons against the onward surge of the overprivileged minority, whose ideal world would see liberty and security as their exclusive preserve alone. 
So basically, that's the structure of the book. There are these three phases. Pre-democratic, which I'll turn to in a minute. <coughs> versions of liberty and security. Then a democratic impulse, which produces the democratic movement, which is assisted by the rule of law, and which brings on board the idea of the protection of human rights, all of which stand for a universalist reading of liberty and security, but each of which is incompletely realized because of the lack of deep embedding, embedment of the democratic idea and of the republican idea. And so that idea is never complete, and it has these weaknesses. And so when we move into the situation we're in at the moment, I would argue, where we are returning to the elitist readings of liberty and security, we are doing so under cover of democracy, the rule of law, and human rights. But that is a kind of camouflage for change rather than uh, a genuine deployment of those terms. I'm trying to make the book universal, and I have in mind Russia, you know, which is a sort of democratic human rights rule of law at the moment. It's a kind of sort of the dystopian future. Now, the book then, you know, I, I talk about this pre-democratic, and I do, I do a lot, uh, I'm not going to read all this bit out, don't worry, uh, <laughs> on Hobbes, because I think Hobbes is really important. I did a big long paper on Hobbes, and I've used a lot of that to try and get under the skin of this subject, because I think Hobbes is very important to how we read liberty and security. And also, I think how England reads liberty and security is very important to the world. We can't undo colonialism. We can't undo the power of England. Uh, and I use England, not the United Kingdom, of course. So these tropes are, have a universalist dimension, which is regarded as rude to point out, because it suggests that only the top thinkers are English. Well, I'm just commenting on influence. And this is the way I read Hobbes' importance. I'll read bits of it, but not all of it. In his first major work, Elements of Law, uh, Thomas Hobbes saw liberty in fairly simplistic terms. I don't mean that as, an offense, as offensive. I mean that as a compliment, actually. As a capacity to act or to forbear from acting, which capacity leads naturally to deliberation as between rival paths. Should I go with my appetites or let my fears triumph? And this, in turn, produces a decision, the will to act or not to act, as the case may be. What is marvelous about Hobbes, and for its day highly original, is how he relegates reason to a sideshow to the main event. It's all about emotions, feelings, wants, aversions. In this world of blameless liberty, we naturally desire what is good for us and seek to avoid what is bad for us. And above all, famously, of course, as people know, what for Hobbes is bad is death, and therefore fleeing from death becomes our thing. And as Quentin Skinner, upon whom I rely for a lot of this, puts it in Hobbes and Republican Liberty, it was for Hobbes obvious that we have a natural tendency to do everything we can to preserve our lives. Now, here's the move. Because this disposition is so very reasonable, we must therefore have the natural right to act to preserve ourselves at all costs. So, you know, arguably, in the modern world, he's the first human rights guy. But this, of course, raises problems. There is not enough of the world to go round. There are too many of us exercising our natural right to do whatever we want at the same time. We couldn't all be simultaneously satisfied. That's why he ends up saying the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And then quoting Skinner, uh, the, a lovely quote, the desperate paradox on which Hobbes' political theory is grounded is that the greatest enemy of human nature is human nature itself. Now, the way out of this conundrum is, lies in obliging ourselves to for, forbear from acting according to our will and power. This requires submission to a sovereign to whom we are henceforth to be, quote, as absolutely subject as is a child to the father or a slave to the master in the state of nature. Because liberty is impossible, our submission to the protective force of the sovereign is practically absolute. Hobbes does have some sense of inalienable rights, so far as I can tell, but these do not figure prominently in his thinking, and he never seriously contemplated any kind of right of revolution against an iniquitous sovereign, so far as I can tell. 
His description of his later book, Leviathan, was as a work that now stands, that now fights on behalf of all kings and all who, whatever name they have, hold regal rights, stands as a description, I think, of the kind of thing that he was doing. So here's a story that produces an absolute abnegation of liberty in the name of security and a handing over of responsibility for security to an unquestioned <coughs> monarch. Now, that's one version of liberty and security, which is pre-democratic. But at exactly the same time, there is emerging a Republican reading of liberty and security. And that's recovering past versions of freedom which see freedom as living in a free state, so much broader than the narrow common sense approach of Hobbes. And I use the obvious example of the levellers, uh, who've been written about very well by Martin Lachlan recently, and also Stephen Sedley, and lots of others. Uh, they were an operation that uh, were around the mid-1640s, and they produced a document which Martin calls a landmark in constitutional history, which, apart from setting out the rudiments of a system of representative, responsible, accountable, and democratic government, demanded also that laws ought to be equal. This is a quote from the levelers. Laws ought to be equal so that they must be good and not evidently destructive to the safety and well-being of the people. So in this last phrase, the safety and well-being of the people, uh, the requirement that the law should not be evidently destructive of that, you have my vision of security, which is sort of the word safety, and liberty, which is well-being, for all the people. So I put up these kind of alternative versions of liberty and security. The first leading to absolute power on the part of the monarch, the second calling for a free state. Now, on one version, the second of those has clearly won. The idea that you need to live in a free state, a republican state, a democratic state, has become the norm. And the rule of law is seen as facilitative of that. And that, in turn, has produced versions of security that echo the leveller's commitment to safety for all. And I go through a little bit of this, but not a lot. The obvious highlights are the development of a kind of welfare system in Germany in the 19th century, the Webb Minority Report, the uh, development of labour administrations in the 20th century, and uh, welfare, not warfare, uh, temple during the war, and uh, the four freedoms of Roosevelt, culminating in the kind of human rights movement after the war. So there's sort of a way in which democracy delivers versions of liberty and security that fit with my universal reading. And the rule of law and human rights are part of that. Now, uh, you will already anticipate, because I've already said, my theories see democracy, republicanism, this version of liberty, as vulnerable because of certain weaknesses in the embedding of republicanism, democracy, in our culture. And these weaknesses are to be found in the way in which democracy embedded itself and in its half-complete or less complete triumph than we sometimes assume. And that then leads on to certain problems in our approach to the rule of law and human rights. And these three together have made us vulnerable to what I've called this kind of neo-democratic retaliation. So that's what I'm going to do in the last few minutes I have. Uh, so let's look at the ways in which I say uh, the Republican triumph has been less complete than the universal democratic narrative would have us suppose. Uh, this is not entirely about form, though of course the United Kingdom, in common with many other democracies, does remain distinctly non-Republican in its retention of the monarchy. 
and at least some other seemingly Republican states find themselves applauding by their vote members of the families of elected rulers. Uh, the obvious example are the Bushes, but Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, and a depressing number of similar examples drawn from post-colonial Africa. The main point is that though the vote has been conceded, and participation in the governing of the state guaranteed to all but the entirely incompetent, this has not produced the renaissance of free-born citizens that many proponents of this vote would have believed would follow. The evidence for the imperfect success of the democratic impulse, I would say, is more importantly evident or seen in the continuing power of private money, in the systemic defects in prevailing constitutional orders from a democratic point of view, the conservative tendencies of state bureaucracies, the lure of populist nationalism, the temptation to indulge in a rhetoric of fear, and the lack of energetic engagement in self-governance revealed by many citizens. Our republican, democratic form of government does not operate in practice in the way that it was assumed by the optimists that it would. The situation uh, has been compounded by the tensions generated by the fear of external attack and internal subversion, on which more shortly. Now, that sort of part of what's gone wrong, in a way, or not, not gone wrong, but what renders democracy less effective than you might have expected and therefore less invulnerable. But there's another one, uh, and I think it affects it theoretically in a very important way. A second aspect, or a further aspect, to the imperfect triumph of Republican ideas relates to a failure to think through properly what individual liberty in a free state entails as a matter of personal as opposed to social freedom. Maybe it's because the language of human rights did not apply here with their focus on the individual, with their setting up of a framework for resisting particular state action against individuals other than in defined and defensible circumstances. Whether or not this is the case, it is clear that Republican thought emphasized as liberty uh, the living in a free state and security as the defense of the free state in a way that certainly didn't pay much attention to the individual and could be construed as practically Hobbesian in the blank check that it gave to authority, albeit this time a different kind of authority, uh, dem Republican democratic rather than despotic. In a free state, matters of security, national state security, are too often left to a single actor without further accountability, and that state's rhetoric of political liberty is a rhetoric about living in a free state, not protecting individuals within the state. So even that great Republican figure, John Milton, was unabashed in his willingness to act against Catholics, but perhaps more seriously from the perspective of this argument, was perfectly happy to clamp down on sedition, albeit he opposed, and he's the best one, you know, he opposed controls on publication in advance, but not laws against sedition. The qualified nature of the Republican triumph, combined with this failure of democratic imagination when it came to individual, as opposed to collective freedom, uh, served to generate a strong undercurrent of hostility to universal liberty throughout even the golden democratic age of freedom. This insecurity has afflicted democratic states, and when allied to this republican tendency to subjugate the individual to the needs of the republic, has produced a series of harsh assaults on individual freedom that have taken place within and been justified by the free state rather than been in opposition and at odds with Well, why has this been so easily permitted? Why has Republican versions of freedom, which have been so abusive of the rights of individuals in the protection of the state, not generated more energetic opposition from the citizens themselves? And this takes me to the second incomplete embedding, which is that of law. Now, obviously, uh, law, the rule of law predates democracy, uh, but it has, in those countries which have adopted republican forms of government, 
led to a large number of cases where courts have quite explicitly supported executive action in the name of the security of the state and have done so without probing deeply into the individual circumstances before them. Uh, the famous maxim is deployed in some of the cases in Michaels and Block, I think, from 1918, the salus populi suprema lex, the safety of the people is the supreme law. And so what we've seen is that law has taken its cue from Republican concerns for security and not stood up for the individual within the system where the state's security has been at stake. Uh, also increasingly in this neo-democratic phase we're going through when laws engage on behalf of the state the response of the state is to bypass the law and so what we have at the moment in this country at the moment is quite a lot of efforts to marginalize the courts by being able to take decisions outside the judicial system in quasi-judicial administrative frameworks which are without the same kind of level of engagement that courts would bring. So this is slightly, it's a variant on the point. Courts either support the safety of the state, the old way, or if courts flex their muscles and engage, they find the state manoeuvring to avoid them. And so you see uh, special advocates, control orders, TPIMs, and a whole story about the way in which the administrative state is returning, which is standing outside the framework of law. So the courts are okay if they do nothing and bypassed if they do something. But neither of those points is the one I want to just uh, bring back to you here before I go on to the human rights thing and finish. Uh, the point I want to make here is that Hobbes is connected to this in, I believe, quite an important way. And let me see, I'll need to read some of this to try and articulate it. Hobbes's theory required that liberty be extensive in the residual sense of being in the presumptive position and at the same time vulnerable to aggressive state action, capable of being smashed if Leviathan judges such repressive action to be essential to the safety of the state. It has been in English law that the residual theory of liberty promoted in the 19th century by Dicey, among others, has really bedded down enjoying to this day an eminence in constitutional law teaching that is only being very slowly eroded by the move to rights. So you are free to do what you want unless the state decides that you shouldn't. Now, Hobbes's combination of an outlandishly extreme commitment to individual freedom, on the one hand, you can do whatever you want, with a deep precariousness, so far as the protection of such liberty is concerned, not if Leviathan moves against you, is only experienced as precarious if the contingent nature of the exercise of your freedom is before you all the time. If it is not, if Leviathan rarely intrudes on you, your family or your immediate community, in other words, the people you know, then the fragile, the fragility inherent in your liberty is not the foreground of your way of thinking. It is the freedom you experience, not the ease with which it is taken away. So, there are two kinds of people. The people who enjoy liberty in a republic, who don't really think anything is going to happen, and the people who have the possibility of things happening at the forefront of their minds all the time, because they know that Leviathan stroke the republic might move against them. These may be, for example, uh, alleged revolutionaries, suspected terrorists, fifth columnists, foreigners who are said to seek to s subvert the state from within, but because they are not you or like you, and of course you never meet them, their vulnerability does not register. In designing a system which turns everything over to Leviathan, while assuring the majority that Leviathan will not challenge their freedom to pursue their individual appetites as they wish, as long as they do not rock the boat, Hobbes produced an artifice which has remained attractive long after the monarchs and despots for whom he has argued were slung from centre stage. 
It has endured right into the democratic era, uh, a time when servitude may have disappeared, but a recognisably Hobbesian, apolitical, selfish passivity has, if anything, fueled by its compatibility with capitalist modes of thought, come into even more prominence. So we do not experience the vulnerability that those who are possibly going to be moved against by Leviathan experience. Uh, so that's the weakness in the rule of law, which is in turn made possible by the weaknesses in the lack of a complete democratic engagement, which is primarily about ignoring the individual. Well, what about, finally, human rights? Now, it seems to me that human rights are potentially the saviour of, I mean, it's a, funny I say this, but the saviour of the democratic framework. <coughs> Because they actually, by prioritizing civil and political, insist on readings of society that are democratic. But by focusing on the individual, they remind you that liberty is about more than a theory of freedom. That it has an immediate protective consequence for everybody. Uh, now, of course, it can uh, be... Uh, misdeployed, as I said at the start, and of course the neo-democratic trend does misdeploy the language of human rights. It can take a number of shapes. You can have a human rights commitment which is simply there as a constitutional requirement and which is ignored. Uh, a bit like maybe Jordan's commitment not to torture people. And when the European Court of Human Rights analyzes it, there's sort of offense taken that it might be subjected to some empirical test. Or Russia's membership of the Council of Europe, which it sees as not incompatible with the invasion of a fellow council member. So you can have simply a sort of empty signification. Or you can have human rights which serve to uh, legitimize, in law, human rights uh, attacks. And so you have systems whereby you can act against marginalized groups, and insofar as any of the individuals in the groups then seek to assert their human rights, you do have a judicial framework, but the judicial framework is so designed to ensure that the end of the process produces uh, an approval of the action as human rights consistent rather than human rights abusive. Uh, so cases like the, I don't know, the Ketling case, the protest, which was compatible with their human rights, the St. Paul's eviction appeal, which I think the judgment's right, by the way, I'm not, I'm not wearing a party propagandist point here, but uh, which goes through Article 10, the right to freedom of protest, which points out that actually it's not available in private property, after be in the United Kingdom, which says, therefore, the removal of the protesters anytime soon is compatible with their human rights, is not an affront to them, removes even the weapon of protest on the basis of the infringement of human rights, because the answer is, actually, we've checked and your human rights are fine, as you are removed. You know, of course, that is a possibility. And an even more, uh, an even more dangerous one, in a way, is the way in which the language of human rights has become a stick with which to beat other cultures. So in this you're in or you're out, which the Republican uh, idea, I suppose, of a sort of homogenous state lends itself to, you have situations where you can define a culture as one that is uh, supportive of the rule of law and supportive of human rights and supportive of democracy uh, in the abstract. And that somehow or other gives that culture uh, an advantage over other lesser cultures which are not so supportive. And that's an idea about human rights which is independent of practice, which is independent of what you actually do. And so that would be, for example, in its more extreme form, what Michael Ignatius have argued for, where you have, the, you have the entitlement to engage in the lesser evil because it's lesser, it's less evil, even though objectively the thing you're doing might be the same, it's less evil because you are defending your own culture. And we see a little bit of that uh, with the government's uh, latest prevent and contest strategy, where they are defining extremism 
not as violent extremism, but as a rejection of our values. And so they're arguing for a move to prevent violent, sorry, a move to prevent extremist speech independent of any connection with violence. So obviously, obviously, the language of human rights can be misdeployed. It can be either just an empty veneer or it can be used through judicial action to legitimise what looks to everybody else as a breach of human rights, or it can be turned into a positive weapon with which to beat other cultures and even underpin military action. Of course it can. But the concentration that human rights gives you on the individual, allied to its determination to have a democratic system which is a real one, with most recently in this country the determination that prisoners should have the right to vote, uh, which is fantastic because it's getting us to think differently about what we mean by democracy, is actually a way of addressing the weaknesses in the democratic achievement, which weaknesses have made us vulnerable to this, if you want, using it again right at the end, the Russian model, vulnerable to a drift towards uh, a camouflaged authoritarianism, and which enables us somewhat to both resist that and energize the rule of law and democratic ideas to resist. So I'm, you know, really old-fashioned. I think these were fantastic ideas. I think they are universal. And I think that we should not fall into the trap of believing somehow or other they're outdated, jaded, tired. Democracy, the rule of law, and human rights. Because these are the three universals that make it possible to reimagine a society in which there is liberty and security for all. I better stop. Thank you very much.